Hello, everyone. Hi. I'm going to get started, if that's OK. Um, my name is Joanna White. Um, I'm Knowledge and Collections Developer at the British Film Institute's National Archive. Um, and in that position, I work with um, the workflows. So I build open source workflows and sometimes closed source workflows for um, all of the video asset management and um, various other document management and interactions that communicate between um, our, in, um, commit, our CMS system and our Black Pearl um, long-term storage system and various other things. But I'm going to be talking to you today about two things. So one is how we use FFV1 at the BFI. And that's the first presentation. Um, and the second is some work that we did about two years ago to replace the media asset management system that we had in BFI called Imogen, um, which was operating a bit too slowly for our workflows as our workflows increased. So we're going to be looking at the scripts that we've put in place to replace that media asset management system. So um, we'll start with FFV1. Um, I've called this presentation How We FFV1 because at no time to wait three, I was thrown into my first ever roundtable for No Time to Wait that was called How We FFV1. Um, it was chaired by Sophie Bunce and had Dave and Carl Jürgen Hoyas there, and I was completely unaware of the company I was keeping in that presentation. Um, if I'd known, I would have been far more stressed than I was. Um, so I was newly into FFmpeg, and I was invited to take part because I'd just been doing some very casual experimentation with FFmpeg at that point as a regional archive that belonged to the BFI's bigger network of archives. Um, it was a pivotal point for me because the information and the community um, support that I got from that point led me to end up with a role in the BFI working with Roll Cooked and FFV1 and then eventually into the developer role that I sit in now. And um, I'm very grateful, really, for the support I've had from this community to get me to that point. Um, so this presentation today is not um, it's going to look at how we work with FFV1 codec for our videotape workflows. Um, I'm only just going to show you the raw cook repository that we have. I've done a lot of presentations for raw cook before, um, so I didn't want to do that today because also Jerome's doing a similar presentation in the other room, so we won't be touching on raw cooked really. So we're going to cover intro to FFV1, just a very basic overview because I'm aware not everybody may know what the FFV1 video codec standard is. Um, then we're going to look at how we convert our V210 MOVs to FFV1. Then how we convert our FFV1 Matroskas back to V210. Um, and then something that we uncovered in that process, uh, some pro problems we were having with um, lossy buffers around the outside, which Dave very kindly helped us to remedy. But I think it's useful to share with you exactly what that problem is, because I expect more people, as they work more with FFV1, may encounter it and uh, we'll want a solution for it. Then we're going to look at our FFV1 to ProRes and FFV1 to H.264 FFmpeg commands very briefly, just to give you an idea of what, what commands we use and the flags and how they work. And then some capture card technology information. So I'd like to quickly introduce FFV1, as I said, for anyone who isn't aware. Um, the FFV1 codec is a lossless video codec developed by, initially by the FFmpeg community and is now standardized under the Internet Engineering Task Force. This is the data tracker for the standardization um, work shown here. So FFV1 first launched in 2003 and was standardized in 2021. So we'll just have a look at that timeline. Uh, thank you to Dave, who's put, put a video with this timeline in. I've just slightly reworked it for my own use today, but basically this is Dave's information. So if anything's wrong, it's not my fault. <laughs> um, so in 2003, FFV1 was launched, which means this year it's 20 years old, which I think is quite an achievement. Um, yeah, it is worth applause. In 2006, the first version was frozen. I should say it was launched by FFmpeg, um, and I think essentially Michael Needham Mayor, I'm not sure, developed the project. Um, so in 2006, that first version was frozen. In 2009, the codec was picked up for preservation use. Not sure by whom, but I'm guessing people in this room. Um, 2010, funding improvements were found because I think it was recognized that it was going to be useful for the preservation 
um, um, preservation communities. In 2012, 14-bit RGB was added, along with multi-threading and sliced CRCs. Um, so multi-threading of FFV1 in an FFmpeg, as I understand it, makes encoding times much faster. Um, and sliced CRCs are multiple checksums that are present in each frame of the FFV1 file. So this means that if a file suffers any damage over time, bit flip or sector loss, et cetera, then FFmpeg can isolate exactly where in that frame within, say, maybe 16 or 24 points within each frame where that damage is. And as I understand it as well, the sliced CRCs are how FFmpeg multi-threads. It takes each slice from within that and spreads it across all the threads of your CPU, and that's how the multi-threading works. So. In 2013, the official release of FFV1 version 1.3 was released. In 2014, the pre-former project started. Um, pre meaning preservation and former meaning formats. So this European Commission funded project supplied essential funds for the development tools and standards that allow archivists to have better control over their selected open formats. And for this, they selected FFV1 and also the Matroska wrapper. In 2016, the pre-former project um, saw the beginning of work towards the standardization of FFE1, um, and also I think it added in 16-bit RGB. And in 2021, the standardization was ratified, as we saw through that IETF document. Um, OK, so there was a question I asked at no time to wait, three, um, for the how how we FFV1, um, and that is how can I see when there's a problem, say if there's bit flip or damage in the, in the FFV1 file. I was really curious at the time to work out how I could work out where the damage was, what it looked like, and I wasn't really sure um, how that slice CRC feature was useful to me. So this is a hex editor. Kieran O'Leary showed me how to use one. Um, please don't use it on your, on your preservation files, but basically it lets you go into a file at the binary level and hack it and break it. And this is me doing that, typing I love FFmpeg into the binary of an FFE1 file. So that it simulates bit flip or damage to a file over time. Um, so when you then come back out and you run it through FFmpeg, what you get is the slice CRC mismatch warning. And that has the time code at the end as well, exactly where in the frame it sits, uh, where in the stream it sits, sorry. And I just think this is a wonderful tool for being able to find out over long a period of long-term preservation when you, whenever you put your FFV1 back into some kind of FFMP, um environment, it's going to tell you exactly where there's damage, if there's damage. If you've got two copies in long-term preservation, that means you can potentially check the other copy, make sure there's no, in, no problems with that tiny little piece of video, and you can edit and sub and make new masters from it, that kind of thing. So I just wanted to share with you how you can use those slice CRCs. So our FFV1 code base is open source and available to view in our GitHub. Um, and we've got the name BFI Data Digipress. Um, the repository is called the Transcoding Scripts. Um, they've been there for a little while, but I've recently added a few extra scripts in that haven't been there. So the repository features descriptions about how our code operates. Um, the repositories are not packaged necessarily for easy installation, but they're useful, I think, for institutions who might want to know more about how we do our coding and work, etc. Um, it can be downloaded via Git clone quite easily, um, but the code isn't agnostic, particularly. It's very much um, written to work with on our own workflows, so there's lots of um, particular kind of environmental paths that you would need changing and updating. But again, as I say, I put lots of notes in all the code, so hopefully if you're learning to code with Bash or with Python, then there's some things that will be useful for you in these repositories. So you can navigate through all of our transcoding code work, um, including viewing our media conch policies, which I'm gradually adding one by one. Um, and yeah, it wouldn't be hard to borrow sort of functions from our Python code and try them and play with them. Um, in your own workflows. Please not, not in a safe environment, though, not with your preservation workflows, definitely. So the first script is our v210 to FFV1 Matroska script. Um, so for a little context, the 
This script um, has been working on our Heritage 2022 videotape digitization project, um, which requires the BFI National Archive to collect and transcode 100,000 different video projects. Um, external suppliers to the BFI digitize those tapes for us, and the BFI digitize some ourselves for regional um, and national archives in the UK. We received the V210 MOV files from different suppliers for conversion to FFE1 Matroska format, which was then put into our long-term preservation. Um, before we did that, that transcoding work, we needed to pass all the V210s through a media conch policy to ensure that there would be no breaks in our transcoding workflows. Um, and <laughs> I just pushed a button to make that thing go around. <laughs> That's embarrassing. Um, the shell script completes um, the transcode with frame MD5 comparisons at the end as well. So I'll have a look at the shell script now. Uh, actually, we'll look at it after this. Before we start transcoding, I mentioned that we put the FFE on Matroska's. Um, before we start transcoding to FFE on Matroska, we put the V210s through a media conch policy. So this is the first half of that policy. Um, if you're not familiar with um, media conch policies, then um, it's open source software um, provided by Media Area, which is Jerome Martinez. Um, if you've just used Media Conch via a graphical user interface or through their software, then you may not have seen an XML policy in this format before. Um, it's this policy that our scripts use via the command line um, to carry out batch assessments of files. If it passes every single thing in that policy list, then um, we get a pass statement returned back to the scripts, and we know that the file can be moved into the transcoding workflow. Um, this policy is basically an AND policy, which means everything listed in the rules needs to be um, ma matched in the metadata of the file. Um, the policy includes name fields where you place the description for the use on the left, a value, which is the metadata item that it needs to match to, the track type, which is usually video, audio, or general, an occurrence and an operator. So here there are checks for exact matches on frame rates, color information, video pixel height, and interlacement. The inset rules towards the bottom are generally uh, nested or policies. So that means that only one of the items within that or policy needs to match to get a positive return back for us. So that's such as bit depth or video pixel aspect ratios where we accept a number of different options. And in the second half, which is just as long, we have more OR policies, checking the video display aspect ratio, format, audio codec, video width, et cetera. Um, the very bottom rule, if you can read it OK, is a separate AND policy, which was a later addition into our workflow. Uh, it checks for source delay timings in the audio tracks. So we were having source delays between the audio and the video, which were breaking our transcodes. Um, so we needed a deep check to ensure that there was no source delay in the audio tracks in our files that we received. So just looking at that one in particular that I've highlighted, um, you can see towards the end it says scope MMT, which flags to media conch software that the rule is to be applied to the media trace block of the FFV1 files. Um, I thought it might be helpful just to talk you through how you might use a media trace rule like this quickly, because I know when I was trying to work it out myself, it was a little bit hard to get my head around. So both media conch and media info can generate a deeply detailed report called a media trace report, which you'll see here. This is a technical report that demonstrates the binary architecture of an audiovisual file set out in blocks. And the report showing here is just such a media trace report. So many audiovisual file formats are based on chunk-based storage of metadata, where a block of data will either contain a data payload or other blocks. With QuickTime, these blocks are called atoms. In AVI, they're called elements. Uh, chunks, sorry, and in Matroskas, they're called elements. So whether the source format specification calls it an element, an atom, or a chunk, or another term, media trace will convert it into a block of data, as shown here. Um, and within those blocks are data fields. So the media conch rule we just looked at was built from blocks of an SD video file, and it needed to check that there was no source delay in the audio track. So the rules value field is built from the names of the blocks starting at the top with file header. Then the next inset block, is um, it takes the track, and then the next inset, it takes the track header, 
And then in the track header block, it's looking for the track width. And in this field particularly, it's looking for that 0, 0.000 match. Um, and the scope MMT suggest, um, tells MediaConch that it needs to look in the media trace in this way. So you may wonder why I needed to find the width indication of an audio track. Um, it was because um, if I needed to identify that it wasn't a video track, and by picking the width zero, then I knew that the source delay that immediately followed it would be an audio track and not a video track. So I'd often seen media conch policies using this scope MMT and wondered what it represented. And I have to thank Jerome for his help in telling me how to use the media trace in this way. Um, and I just wanted to share it because I think it's a really useful tool. It's like a superpower when you're trying to um, inquire for really deep metadata in, uh, in a video file. And you can find out about Media Trace uh, more on the Media Area website. So this is the bash script. We've sorted our V210 mobs into the pass and fails now, and we've just got the passes that are coming through into this workflow. They're moved into a transcode watch folder. And from here, a shell script finds them and converts them into FFV1 Matroskas. This script was written by my predecessor, Edward Anderson and was later enhanced by Head of Data and Digital Preservation, Stephen McConaughey. Um, it receives one file path at a time and just processes that one file before exiting and being re relaunched again for another file. So I thought we'd just go through some of the steps in the code, if that's useful, um, and just talk about the code. So you'll see in this block global variables for paths um, that are a dollar sign one and a dollar sign two. And these are arguments that have been supplied into the script at launch. So um, the one is the path to the v210 mov, and the two is a bash watch me do method, which Edward um, built into the scripts. And uh, it looks for the statement created, which means that the, the file can be processed. Functions for log creation and checking downtime control restri restrictions are next. Um, at the BFI, we have a, a downtime control JSON file, which we use by changing a bool from true to false when we want to stop certain script actions across all of our servers. Um, so it's quite a useful little way just to, whenever we come to patching servers once a month, for example, just to change all of the trues to false to make sure that all the scripts stop. Saves us having to go around all the different scripts and, uh, and stop them all manually. Okay. So the script begins at this point, and if the conditional statement, um, and if conditional statement, sorry, checking that the number two is equal to created. And then it logs the example um, with just the word log because it, we've built that log function earlier on. The control check um, would exit here at this point if it found that that transcode H22 key and the download control um, JSON was set to false. So it checks for the correct MIME type, video, audio, or application. Um, if if it matches, then it proceeds. And the MIME type is the multipurpose internet mail extension. Uh, it's a standard that indicates the format of a file. We tend to divide our files into four categories. So that's video, audio, image, or application. Um, application covers any type of binary data that doesn't fall explicitly into one of the previous three types. Uh, sometimes I do find MXF files fall into that application. Um, and MPEG TS files, actually, from our video off-air TV recording. So. It's, uh, it's not always foolproof. So the next is to check if FF Pro returns a zero X code against the video file. So that means that the file is basically a well-formed video file, audio-visual file. Um, if it doesn't, the script will exit at that point. At this point, we configure local variables for our frame MD5 paths. Um, and temporary and permanent file names. It uses Linux's base name feature to capture the last name of the file path and from that build the file name variable. Um, it checks if the temporary file name already exists so that it won't recreate a file that's already being processed. And it also checks if the finished destination exists. So for the same reasons, it won't create a file that's already just been created by another script. It also checks for v210mov frame md5s um, if they exist already, and if they do, it deletes the existing frame md5s and recreates a new one for the v210mov. Is that one? Right? I'm a little bit behind my graph. So frame md5 mar um, files like this one here are generally used to validate 
lossless transcoded files like FFE1 to V210. They are a, they're like a standard MD5 checksum, but a frame MD5 is a more granular version of a regular MD5, allowing frame level checksum generation for every frame of an audio visual file. The frame MD5 lists all of the frames and their individual hashes for one video stream and two audio streams, which is the default, but you can change that with your commands. Um, so the audiovisual asset is decoded to raw video. You can see that in the codec ID at the top uh, by the frame MD5 command, which is run out of it's one of FFmpeg's tools, basically. Um, it's worth noting if you want to um, store frame MD5s for a little while. I thought it would be a great solution for the for the previous archive that I worked at. That they do change over time as the PIX format um, function changes in FFmpeg. So your different FFmpeg versions might create completely different frame MD5s of of one particular video asset. They're both correct. It's just that the pixel format has altered the way it converts it to raw video. So the, you won't be able to store them for long time preservation checks. The hash code, I believe, is the bit that changes. Uh, does it? That's great. The layout of the frame MD5 also changes too. Thank you, Peter. OK, so the next stage of the script is a log note being written to the transcode, which is at the top. And then using media info, we extract the input standard PAL SDR other and supplied video height. In this example, the media info command is being called within the parentheses allocated to the variables input standard and height. Variables are a name for a kind of container that holds bits of or a type of data like integers such as numbers, strings of texts or float numbers, that's numbers with decimal places. The variable name is the way you reference the data retrieved from uh, media info. So this section now checks if the file is PAL and if the height is equal to 608 pixels. Um, why 608 pixels, you might be wondering. Um, some of our 100,000 videotapes were from BFI collections and were captured in-house and some of our video operations teams capture 608 line height um, for PAL source. Um, and that's because we retain the 608 to keep the vertical blanking intervals at the top of the video in the hope of extracting teletext from the VBI um, in the future, still to be tested. So if it's PAL, then it encodes with the first block and color data specifying PAL SD, which is BT47TBG. And if it's not PAL, then the script just assumes it's NTSC file and encodes in the second block using the color data for specified for NTSC SD, which is the SIMP T170. Otherwise, they're exactly the same. So next, there's a log note to state the end of the transcode that's output to the logs. Um, this is a similar block here to the previous frame MD5 creation of the V210. Uh, so this is now making the frame MD5 for the FFV1. Um, it checks first if it exists already, then deletes it and creates another one, because sometimes a lot of our scripts are going over the same files twice. Um, so then using the Linux diff command, which checks for difference, the script checks the frame MD5 for the MOV is identical to the frame MD5 for the Matroska. So with the diff, um, it returns nothing if they match. Uh, but if they don't match, it returns the full list of the, the files that don't match. And this is what a, mitch, a mismatch might look like um, using some software called Meld. This example shows the difference graphically with blue highlights for mismatched audio in this example. Um, with arrows that attempt to show where the misalignment is. Um, so this one, I think you see audio files, which are the one, and the video files, which show stream zero. Um, this would be a very unsuccessful frame MD5 match that would return a fail using the diff um, command, and it would definitely be sent back to the vendors for recapture. If successful, um, the output is for the success, um, then it the success variable is, variable is populated and a log's created that moves the command in. Uh, that, sorry, that sentence makes no sense. It basically moves the v210 file into a success folder and moves the frame MD5s into a pass folder. Um, 
And so that marks the end of the transcoding script and the log. The final act is to pass the remaining file list to parallel for batch renaming. So all of the prefixes, when we transcode, we prefix with partial at the beginning of the name so that um, no other scripts pick up that file. But at the point the transcode is completed, all those partials have the partial removed and then the file is available for the next script to access. Oh, and that's in that bit block there, my apologies. So to look more closely at our FFmpeg command, um, and this is really for anyone who's maybe not used FFmpeg before, um, we start with the FFmpeg-i and the input, which calls the FFmpeg program um, and supplies the input file path to it. This is command line kind of um, commands that you put into the, for, for using FFmpeg. We next use the ignore edit lists one, um, which ignores the edit lists specifying mov wrapper time code mapping. We have the dash sn and the nost din, which is subtitle streams um, aren't, aren't being accepted from the um, v210 mov. And we also stop FFmpeg from reading any standard inputs that might be made into it, which is the no standard inputs flag. We use um, codec for the video stream selected as FFv1. We use the G1, which is group of pictures set to one frame, meaning that we want lossless interframe compression from FFV1 for this file. Level 3 selects FFV1 codec version 3. And then we select CA copy, which basically copies across the audio that we've got in the V210 mov straight across to the FFV1 file. Uh, we use the very important map 0, which maps all of the streams from the input to the finished file, um, except uh, dash dn means don't transfer any data streams, because I believe at that point that it was written, data streams weren't supported in FFV1 and probably still aren't, or not sure. Need to research that. So slice CRC1 ensures that the slice CRCs are enabled for the FFV1 codec. Um, and slices24 suggests that we want 24 slices per frame in our um, FFV1 files. Then we have three color pieces of information, color primaries, set for BT470, color trace, BT709, and color space, BT470. So this is PAL SD coloring. Um, then we have color range one, which specifies the full color range, um, is passed from the MOV into the FFV1. Dash N answers no to any questions FFmpeg asks, and and then it will exit if any questions receive the no. And then temp um, is the name of the output file for the, um, for the new FFV1 Matroska. So this basic command has been responsible for the majority of the 100,000 programs um, transcoded to FFV1 Matroska since 2019. Um, it's worked pretty hard, the script, but it's been very reliable. It's a pretty basic bash script, really. Um, but, you know, it, it's, it's done an awful lot of work. So um, it's important one as it saves us a lot of storage as well. So those 100,000 programs are now all roughly about half the size that they would have been if we kept them in V210 MOV. OK. So why would we need to return the FFV1 Matroskas back to V210? Um, there's two cases, really, in the BFI why we need to do this. Firstly, some of our regional archive partners in the Heritage 2022 videotape digitization project have archive policies that support long-term preservation of V210 MOV and ProRes MOVs in some cases. Secondly, our own archive staff sometimes need to complete complex edits on the videotape files that we have preserved. And the softwares out there at the moment that they use don't support FFV1 Matroska. So. For these use cases, um, we've written Python scripts that have been developed to automate that move back to v210 file. And there are two scripts that we use. Um, they're very similar, really. So I'm just going to show you the Heritage 2022 version of the script today. Uh, so this is the batch transcode H22 FFV1 v210 script. We use a shell script to launch it, um, and that's so that we can use some open source software called GNU Parallel to launch multiple versions of the script. 
So we only have one Python script. It handles one input at a time, which is the path, file path for the file. But with the shell script kind of manages pushing all of those file paths into the, into the, pro, into the uh, Python script. So if you're playing with Bash, it's worth noting that the shebang in line one, um, which tells the computer what language it needs to read the script in, the dash x in this case is there to print out verbatim message um, to you. It's like a test feature, which is really useful when you're starting to write py um, shell scripts. It just echoes everything to you in the, in the script so you've got a really clear idea of what's happening. Global variables are established including variations of transcode paths for selections of archive content. Um, it refreshes the batch transcode text file, which is where it stores all of the different file names. Um, it marks the start of the script run into the logs and confirms the paths that will be targeted in those logs. It finds, I haven't got any more. Let me move these down. That's it. It, find, it uses the find command to look in that supplied folder for any um, files that end with .mkv and haven't been modified in the last 30 minutes, which is important to, to state because we need to make sure that files that are being copied into that folder, for example, um, aren't partially copied in before they're being processed and handed on to the next script. And so it updates the log finally before using the grep command to then grep that text file that it's written all the file paths into and supply them one at a time into GNU parallel. And as you can see, it says job 16 on there, so it will run 16 parallel Python scripts at once. Um, so what's GNU parallel? Um, it's really worth talking about. It's an open source tool made by the Free Software Foundation, and it's a really great way to start being efficient with your transcoding in a simple way without having to get into the complexities of um, Python multiprocessing, for example. Um, it separates encoding jobs across your CPU cores, maintaining a maximum CPU and I.O. activity at all times. It is free software to download and use, but it requires some installation. Um, it's not too complicated, though. So as you can see in our code example, we launch our jobs from a pipe operator. A pipe is um, that little red vertical line you can see, which passes the standard output of the command to the left and pipes it to the standard input of the command on the right. So in this case, the list of paths retrieved by the grep search in the map, um, looking for mount is piped to the sort u, which um, removes any non-unique non paths from that group. And then it pipes that again into the parallel command. And then parallel takes 16 file paths at a time, launches 16 Python scripts. And the curly brackets at the end are where each individual path from that list is passed to all 16 different script launches. Um, if you're unsure how many jobs you might want to push, push through to your computer, you don't have to use the jobs command. Parallels max jobs flags flag along with the load flag will help you um, help the software kind of work out how many jobs it should run itself. Um, and that um, checks the maximum free memory and the maximum I.O. limit and the CPU usage of the computer that it's working on. It's really helpful if any of these are a limitation in your workflow to let the software do it for you. It will prevent encoding jobs crashing because any one of these, um, if any one of these exceeds the, mo the, the point of no return, if you like, then it will just drop the jobs down for you. It also maps job progress and includes um, a list of complete jobs so far. Um, it's usable for Linux, Unix systems. I think it's a little bit complicated to install for Windows, but you can install it using git bash by enabling the Windows subsystem. Um, Linux feature. Okay. So next, we're going to look at the Python scripts. Um, I thought it might be helpful just to quickly give you an overview of a few features in the Python scripts in case you go to look at the repository that you'll come across. Um, they always start from line one with the Python shebang. So the shebang tells the Unix command line shell where to find the interpreter for the language that the script needs to run. Um, it has to be at the very top of the script. Um, we don't actually use this feature to load any of our code, but it's there in case other people need it. Um, below the shebang, I've always, uh, I always have um, a detailed comment section, it's very detailed. So I put all of the, the way the script works into that comment section there, as much for myself 
as for my colleagues, because I don't always remember what the script does and when there's 50 scripts, um, it's really helpful for me to review it. Next, you'll always find that the imports for come underneath the notes um, for the many of those of the Python standard library. So we've got OS, which is the operating system package for directly communicating with OS. Sys has system-specific parameters. The JSON import is the encoder and decoder for JSON file conversions, um, which turns them into a dictionary, which is really useful in the code. Um, there's also Shutil, which is a shell utilities that helps with file operations like copy and remove. Um, logging, which is the Python module that helps create script logs when reporting, and different levels such as info, warning, error, or critical. Uh, subprocess, import subprocess is a really valuable um, Python module which we, which we use to spawn new processes and connect to their input and output pipes to obtain return codes or outputs. I use this subprocess module a lot for FFmpeg and for media area tools in the code. So there's also a local section where I import a module that I've um, written with underneath it, I think it says, yeah. So that's a local module that I've written myself that I import underneath the global imports. So under the imports is the global variables, which I use across all the scripts. So they're um, best displayed in capitals so that I can differentiate them from local variables in the code. Um, and they're variables that I need to use all the way through the code. So I put them at the beginning um, capitalized in that way. These ones are just our um, secret key, kind of like environmental, um, environmental paths that link to our storage paths, our H22 paths and our QNAP storage. So the next block is usually um, the setup for the logging module, which you'll see. Here you're configuring your logging by giving the logger a unique name, creating an output path, setting formatting with date first, then log warning level, etc. And here next is a list of the different scripted functions I've written for the FFE1 to V210 script that the main will call. So main is the main function that actually drives the whole activity of the code. Um, so they're folded down at the moment, so you can just see the list of all the names. But they include the check control function, uh, which is present in most of my scripts, which I described earlier as part of the downtime control JSON system that we have working across all of our servers. Um, then there's the get color, which is going to use the FFV1. Um, it's going to use media info to get color information from the FFV1. Get interlace is um, a, mo a small function that gets the interlacement information, again, using media info through the subprocess change path, which controls the different path outputs that I need for the script. Create FFmpeg command is usually a pretty large function that uh, handles all of the different um, FFmpeg flags that I need to create. Conformance check um, uses media conch with subprocess again to uh, check that the finished FFE1 Matroska, no, V210 Matroska, matches our policy for that. And there's a make MD5 function which handles creation of MD5, frame MD5s for both the FFE1 and the V210, so that we can do those lossless comparisons again on the flip side of this uh, for the V210 conversion. Diff check manages the checking of the frame MD5s. And then we've got a failing log, um, which just outputs any failures that we find. Um, we'll look at these a bit later on in the code. You'll also see for most code um, that at the very end of the script is a name main idiom shown here. This protects the script from being run accidentally if imported as a module into another, code, into another script. It only allows it to run when the code is called as a standalone script. So I nearly always name all of my um, scripts in this way and have a main uh, function which drives all of the activities of the code. Okay. So, lots of code, by the way. I should have forewarned you that this was going to be mostly talking at depth about code. So our shell script has now launched our Python script and there are 16 of these running at once. Um, so let's see what steps each Python script makes against each single file um, that's supplied to it. So we're looking at the main function, which I said earlier drives all of the activities of the script. So the first action is to create a logger list, which collect, collects log messages during the script run. Because we've got 16 parallel scripts running, um, and one log really that 
captures all of the information. I don't want the various scripts to trample one another and for all the messages to get mixed up so it's not clear which log message is referring to which file. I tend to gather the log messages throughout the script and then push it once at the end of the code. Um, the script starts with a log output, checks the downtime control restrictions, and then it uses something called sysargv to extract the file path that's been passed into the script at the moment that it's launched. So that's one of the arguments passed into the code from the shell launch script. Um, it ensures that the supplied file is named correctly, um, and then it extracts the metadata from that um, FFE1 file to build the FFmpeg command. It then runs two checks um, to make sure that, that there's no files that have come through that don't start with an n underscore or that have mkv in the path. If either of those exist, then the script exits at that point. So where you see the set field equals, um, you're creating a variable here that will be populated by the results of the get interlacement function, which is just shown here. This function uses that subprocess command um, and it calls ff uh, calls media info and you can see the media info command at the top it's been broken into sections which are within a list which subprocess requires you to supply the command in list form um, so the very the media info command is then called by the subprocess check output call um, the response is captured into the um, interlacement setting variable and this variable is then converted from bytes string into a utf encoded string um, and then later on, the content of that string is checked to see whether there's TFF, BFF, or PROG been returned from media info call against the, v, against the uh, FFE one. And then this is converted a bit lower down into a lower lowercase version of that same version. So TFF uppercase is how it's received from media info. But for the command to work in FFmpeg, it needs to be TFF lowercase, where it's inserted into the command later. So that's what that conversion is managing. Next, the color data variable is populated by the get color function. In the same way, um, subprocess is used to call media info twice for the color primaries and the matrix coefficients colors. It converts the media info responses into FFmpeg compatible versions. For example, the bt.709 uppercase is converted into bt709 no dots lower cases. And these two bits of color information are then passed back into the main command. Next, the FFmpeg data is sent to create the FFmpeg command. Um, I'll skip one there. Okay. And this function um, builds the FFmpeg command for us. Here you can see that each section of the script is given its own, um, each section of the FFmpeg flag is given its own small little um, list form and the supplied FFmpeg data that we've that we've um, passed into this command is then populated into the color building block and the interlacement block and the style of um, breaking the command up into smaller pieces in this way it's not really necessary at this stage to do it in this way but because I have other scripts that work with more complexity, which we'll look at later, um, I tend to break all of the different FFmpeg flags up into their own little groups and name them. So then a neat version of this command is printed to the log. And then using the time module, we capture the start time of the encoding um, and the FFmpeg encoding is launched using the subprocess call. And then this is um, written in try accept blocks to make sure that if there's any exceptions with the um, FFmpeg call, that those are caught and the logs are updated to say that there was a problem with the file. And then at the bottom, there's a tock. So I've got tick and tock. The tock marks the completion time. And then there's a little bit of a sum to work out the seconds from that difference in time. And those are printed to the log to give us an overview of how long all of our transcodes are taking. So the transco is now completed, and the script wants to ensure that the new v210 mov is identical to the FFE mov Matroska. So again, timing the function, we make the um, frame MD5 using the frame MD5 function. Um, let me see if I can pull that in. There we go. 
So it, um, the first, the function calls up the change path function to get the transcoding path for the FFE1 file. Then it builds two new path names for the MKV and the MOV frame MD5 files. Um, and it outputs those um, for the outputs for the frame MD5s that are made. The very long lines of code that you can see there, um, we're going to look at those in the next section. They're a fix for an unex unexpected problem that we encountered when we were trying to do frame MD5 checks from FFE1 Matroskas to V210 MOVs. So this sees completion of the timing and the lists there. So the MD5, TikTok, make MD5, it gives us the times and we output that to the log two. The separate frame MD5 um, files are checked then with the diff check function uses subprocess to capture the response of the diff command. The sudo is a prefix that we use just to make sure that admin privileges are supplied to the diff file um, so that we can ensure that we can get a response from it. Sometimes we had a few failures depending on the storage that we were using. Um, it has a conditional statement then to check if match or fail have been returned into the string and those are passed back to main. So now we have... Um, a check which makes sure that match is in the result and the match is confirmed in the logs for successes and the frame md5s are moved to the frame md5 path global variable next the block creates a whole file md5 checksum generates the path it needs for the transcoded file then makes the checksum okay um if you recall, we had one import that was for the Python script um, written to the make checksum. This is where it's executed, and this is the short code it launches for that. Oh, I've lost my way a little bit. My apologies. So anyway, the next step is for the check um, checks that the checksums are valid. So it's making um, a check whole file checksum for the file, and it makes sure that the checks are valid. And then the cleanup function is triggered. This cleans up the function. Um, responsible for calling up the media conch policy for the v210 mov to check that the file matches the metadata requirements. Let me see where that is. Okay, that's there. Oh, I've got too many pages. It's too complicated, this script. It doesn't bear well that I, I get confused with it when I write these things, does it? You can see why I put so many notes and everything. So the, for the frame MD5 matches, the script ends here, but for those who didn't pass, the else statement starts a new process. Okay. And that's at the bottom there. Okay. I fuzzed over that a little bit, I apologize. But um, So the frame MD5 manifest paths are created and prepared, prepended failed. If they fail, uh, the frame MD5 failures are moved to their failure path using the shoe till copy. The FFE1 Matroska file is moved to the local frame MD5 failures folder path using the shooter move, and the V210 is moved to the failures, and then the logger list is written output. So hopefully <laughs> you got some sense of how the script works there. Um, but I want to get on to the more important thing. Um, problems we have with the lossy buffers in our files. Um, our lossless conversions from V210 MOV to FFE1 Matroska threw up some problems a couple of years ago for which we couldn't really find a solution ourselves. The frame MD5s weren't matching for any of the video frames despite our repeated attempts to convert them. Um, thankfully, a short conversation with Dave revealed the, the potential solution um, in the Apple technical document TN2162, which he was kind enough to explain quite clearly to me. He suggested it could be a problem introduced by the capture card technology when the video was first created as a V210 MOV. It outlines in this document um, mapping and coding schemes for QuickTime files developed from digital video industry specifications such as REC, ITUR, BT601-4. For this example, we looked to scheme B, which you can see here. Why is an unsigned integer C, B, and C are offset binary integers? Certain Y, C, B, and C, R component values are reserved as synchronization signals and must not appear in a buffer. So according to Dave, for 10-bit video like, our, like those tested by our scripts, 
these buffer values are 0, 1, 2, 3, or 10, 20, 10, 21, 10, 22, and 10, 23. So the document continues that the writer of a QuickTime image is responsible for emitting these values, and the reader of a QuickTime image may assume that they are not present. So according to Dave, who's in the room, so it's very weird to quote him. The remaining component values, so he's gone, um, 4 to 63, 961 to 1019, for n equals 10 bits, accommodate occasional filter undershoot and overshoot in image processing. In some applications, these values are used to carry other information, e.g. transparency data. Um, so, I'm just going to try and explain that in a way that I understand, so hopefully you'll understand it as well. Um, the videotape is captured using the capture technology, like Blackmagic cards, for example, as an uncompressed V210 MOV and saved to local storage. From here, it's converted to FFE1 Matroska and moved to our long-term storage. Um, a year or so later, we retrieve it from long-term storage, convert it back to V210 using FFmpeg for dispatch to our regional archives. So the video files created are shown here. Let's imagine them as binary frames from the video file. This is what the buffer area might look like according to Apple's technical standards. And this buffer shouldn't, be, shouldn't have any data written into it for the Apple um, V210 MOV. So FFmpeg follows these guidelines when creating an Apple MOV file, emitting signals within this value range, the red line. But for the FFV1, this isn't the case as it's not beholden to those st technical standards. And so there isn't this limitation with the FFV1. So data is written into that buffer. This wouldn't cause a frame MD5, five frame MD5 problem between our FFV1 and V210 FFmpeg transcodes on the right if the capture technology had respected this Apple restriction as well. But certain capture card technology, Blackmagic's being one of them, um, they don't follow these guidelines um, specifically. And so these buffer values can be populated with information. When FFmpeg transcodes the V210 into the FFV1, they remain lossless. Uh, but when the FFV1 is retranscoded back to the V210, it correctly assumes that these values should be empty and compresses them, so they become lossy. So this becomes a problem when you run a frame MD5 comparison with the raw video conversion. You have lossy converted sections in the V210 frame MD5 and lossless converted raw video sections in the FFV1 frame MD5. So if as with my scripts, a positive frame MD5 comparison signals a successful transcode, then potentially with an issue like this, you face a lot of repeated transcoding attempts that are actually false flags. Thankfully for us, Dave not only explained the solution, but also provided amendment to our frame MD5 commands that you can see there with that really long YUV LUT trim, which actually removes that buffer section of the video frame. And that allows us to compare the data within the frame, um, excluding the buffer, um, into, to convert those sections only into raw video and compare only those pieces. Um, and that basically got us through the frame MD5 mismatches problems, and we were able to match most of our files that were failing before that. So thank you, Dave, for everybody at the BFI National Archive is very grateful for this fix, and it's being used daily. But I wanted to share it, really, because it's hard to make it, make it legible, so I thought a graphic might help. And, and it's a really important thing that more people might fall foul of in the future. So we don't have scripts specifically written um, for FFV1 conversion to ProRes, but I'm going to share with you a command that we use quite often in our, in our um, team. So ffmpeg-i calls the ffmpeg command again and supplies the input file. We use the map zero to map all the streams from the input to the output file. Here we use the um, codec for the video stream, uh, and ProRes KS is, I believe, one of the best ProRes encoders for interlaced and Rec 709 support. We select profile V3, which selects ProRes H22 422HQ. I think four is 444. I can't remember quite how the others sit. Um, then we have chroma subsampling set for f YUV422 with 10-bit um, Litlendian. 
Then we have a codec copy again. We're very lazy with our audio at the BFI. We just copy it across all the time. Um, we're very happy with PCM 16-bit. So um, we copy the audio codec straight across. Here we've got vendor AP10, um, which selects the vendor as the uh, Apple or AP10. And I believe that helps with viewing in some video players, QuickTime player amongst them. Not entirely sure if it's really necessary, but we put it in there anyway, just in case. Then we use the flags, the um, plus ILDCT, which ensures the output has interlaced field encoding. Then we pass those color primaries through, because if we don't pass those color primaries through, then they're not in the finished file. So you will have slightly poorer metadata for the color information in your ProRes file. And so we pass all three in. Now, they're exact matches of the color information in the FFV1 Matroska, obviously, not just kind of guessed um, items. Then we select mob flags fast start, which ensures metadata for viewing before download is moved to the start of the file, so it buffers basically in playback. And then we select the output file. And the same for our FFV1 to H.264 conversion. We don't really have a specific transcode script for it, but we do have a um, kind of some FFmpeg code that we use. Again, FFmpeg I and the input. We map zero again, everything, so that we ensure that all the audio streams are there, basically. Um, we select the codec for the video stream as libx264 for the H.264 codec. We set CRF28, which is a very low CRF, um, considering, but the range is 0 to 51, um, available for chrominance 420p, I believe. Um, the default in FFmpeg is 23. We did a bit of testing, and we found that 28 was about as high as you could go to see the most compression against a file without it being visually obvious, um, and also gaining the most saving uh, space-saving options for us. So 28 was our um, choice. We have uh, PIX format chroma subsampling for the YUV420 with eight bits. We use video filter um, YADIF, which is yet another deinterlace filter, which is a great name, um, to make it progressive, which we find is essential for MP4 files because they're mostly supplied through computers. And when people watch interlacement on computers, it's quite confusing, I think. So we always make them progressive. We have, again, the copy. Oh, no, we're actually con converting the codec on the audio here. We're, we're selecting the AAC codec. And we are having that mob flags fast start again to make sure that the um, metadata is viewable immediately with buffering. And then we have the output setting at the bottom. There is an, a good alternative um, MP4 transcoding script on the FF Improviser website. I don't know if you're aware of it, but Amir Open Source have an FF Improvisers page, which is brilliant for um, supplying preservation FFmpeg commands. And on there, there's a nice H.264, H.265 transcoding um, FFmpeg command, which uses the GPU. So it's possibly a quicker way to transcode. OK, so just a quick word on our FFv1 um, uh, capture card technology. Um, a recent development for the BFI is to fund, along with the Norwegian Film Archive, the development of an FFV1 codec capture ta card technology. Um, it's already being used in our digitization um, suites, the Bluefish Epoch Supernova CG card, um, used in conjunction with Bluefish's Ingestor software. Um, it's reduced a great deal of transcoding energy in our servers and makes moving files to long-term storage much quicker. Bluefish is proprietary software, but because it's capturing um, to such an important archival FFV1 standard, I think it's worth sharing here at no time to wait. We now capture most of our videotape direct to FFV1 Matronska, thanks to this development. We use HP Z8 desktop workstations for this capture. We have the machines using SSD or HDD media drives, which are striped RAID 0. Um, you get pretty good storage on those. We, we run each workstation with two cards, providing six inputs in total. So the Bluefish cards can be flashed to be all four connectors, um, four inputs or two inputs and two outputs. We don't use the outputs at all, so we have six inputs instead. 
which means six concurrent captures on, on any given workstation. So we run three DigiBeta workstations concurrently, two cards in each, so therefore we're getting eight videotape captures concurrently throughout the day. 18, sorry. Um, but just to balance things, we have also, oh, gone too far, uh, the wonderful software built by um, Dave and others, uh, V-Record, which is um, an excellent option, I think, for capturing to FFV1 for those who aren't doing that yet or want to know more about it. Um, it has some amazing preservation features, which includes digitization logs being embedded into your Matroska wrapper if you select FFV1 Matroska. Um, and also a choice of FFV1 codec that you want to use, like the slices that you need. Um, it's just got, everything is just sort of built for the preservation archivist. So I think definitely take a look at vRecord if capturing one file at a time is adequate for you. And just a note about um, FFE1 Matroska workflows at the BFI. We do also do a lot of work with Raw Cooked. Um, I've spoken about it a lot, and I'm aware that today there was Jerome's um, Raw Cooked presentation workshop on as well, and I didn't want to duplicate content, but we do have a lot of um, scripts in our DPX encoding repository, which is our Raw Cooked workflows, basically. So we use FFE ones there for all our 2K and 4K film preservation of RGB and Luma Y films, captured in-house, and also our legacy film projects. This software standard has saved us a lot of space. Potentially, I think one project alone saved us about one and a half petabytes of data. We use the attachment feature that comes with the Matroska file to store lots of additional metadata about the original DPX sequences um, and their sequence structures, etc., in that Matroska file. Um, it's an amazing tool, and I'm not covering it specifically today, but any questions which we have time for now, I'm happy to answer. So thank you. I have a microphone, so I can pass it around for any questions for Joanna. Hi, Radislav. Uh, hello, I haven't understand uh, which uh, hardware support V-Record, which uh, seems to be maybe the, at this moment, best uh, tool, uh, best open source tool that can capture in a good uh, shape the material. So which hardware support? I know for DV, but which rest? Whereas in server workstations, that kind of uh, no uh, capture hardware, capture cards, that type of thing. Um, well, I because I see the Bluefish, but I'm afraid that uh, FFmpeg doesn't support Bluefish, support only um, SDK from uh, Blackmagic. Even Edge are not supporting, which is a good thing. And I will propose next. Uh, this, if BFI wants to uh, support the old uh, adrenaline and module from IVID, because there are a lot of those second hand which are very cheap, very good for preservation of video materials, but uh, IVID doesn't more care about them, have no documentation, don't sell software, etc. So mm. we can reuse them uh, as a hardware uh, capture on uh, FFmpeg. But right now, in this moment, which hardware it support? Thank you. That um, sounds really interesting. Unfortunately, um, the decisions for hardware capture, setup, configuration all sit within a different department to the one I'm within, and so I don't have the information for you on that, I'm afraid. Um, we just process the files once they are passed through to the data and digital preservation department, and that's really why the code and the conversions using FFmpeg is the area that we think most about. Um, Bluefish was already established in our videotape capture workflows, so adding uh, FFE1 to that was um, an easy and obvious choice for us to move the FFE1s into our workflows more, more quickly and easily than going through a processing, um, transcoding processing phase. But I would definitely recommend also vRecord, which is an excellent tool as well, and uses FFmpeg if FFmpeg is what you want to use for your conversions. Um, I had a, just a question about being a GitHub repository manager at BFI. I was curious if you were aware of any other institutions using these scripts and if there were any external contributions that like helped support them? 
Uh, none at the moment. Um, the idea frightens me a little bit because uh, this is my code and I might have put some bugs in there, but we don't have anything at the moment. I mean, the DPX encoding, we've had some inquiries and we've had some institutions who have forked them and I believe are using them, but I haven't had any recent updates. Um, so it's all quite... I think because they're not agnostic and they're not easy to install and use immediately, um, they're probably not going to be everyone's first choice, but I'm hopeful really more that people can read them, look at the functions, look at the way we do things, and learn as new developers ways of actually using the tools um, to build their own kind of tools, if that makes sense. Cool. More questions? Uh, I'm going to take a while to get back there. Hang on. Sit down. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, from the GitHub, we can learn things for other uh, fields because I'm in software preservation, so I'm not uh, dealing with video files, but with softwares and disk images. So thank you for <laughs> the GitHub. And I just was wondering about the context. How long did it take to develop this? And did you have an, like, an extra budget? Because uh, yeah, we want to develop things like this for checksum and for conversion of disk images, but we are two and we don't have the resources. So I was thinking, can you explain the context in which you could develop all of this? Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, when I was first taken on at the BFI, I was in a Heritage 2022 position, so my job was to kind of govern the, uh, the DPX um, conversion to FFV1 specifically. Um, my boss, uh, line manager Steve McConaughey, managed to um, find budget for a developer position and I was lucky enough to get that post at the BFI. And I think once the developer position came into being, suddenly there was resources to start building these workflows. Um, to build a script like the transcoding script takes maybe a couple of weeks researching the scripting. Having some understanding of Python already helps with that. So many of the scripts that I write use the Python standard library. Um, so we're not using a lot of packages or external things. We're just using the standard library to work through them. And then sub-process to work with these amazing open source tools. Um, the, a lot of the servers already have these open source tools installed on them. So implementing the scripts onto the servers isn't too challenging for us because we use Media Area and FFmpeg really everywhere in our workflows. It's, it's all through all of our servers. So it's not too complicated if you have someone who can write the Python and if you have team members who understand the way, maybe if we're using APIs, for example, understand the way the APIs are set up and configured, that's probably some of the bigger um, research is like working with third party kind of like CMS systems and that kind of thing. Simple transcoding scripts, not too complicated um, with a, bit, a little bit of research. I hope that helped. Um, you said something like uh, 100,000 programs went through those uh, code, actually, uh, which really is a lot. Um, and uh, my question is, is that everything that went into the archive, or um, is it, or do you make different, um, do you have different workflows and scripts for in-house digitizations, uh, born digital stuff that comes from outside and so on. And how does that affect your, uh, your scripts and your workflow here? Okay. Um, so that 100,000 was just one of our projects, um, the Heritage 2022 project, which I might look to my colleague Lucy in a minute to expand that a bit, bit more. The 100,000 um, are items, so they're program items. Sometimes we have multiple items on one tape, so it would be the capture of one tape and then we have a series of scripts called the splitting scripts, which take time codes from an associated item record kept in our database, which has the cut times in them, and FFmpeg within our splitting scripts then splits that up. So the 100,000 might not literally have been 100,000 individual captures. It might have been like a, a third of that possibly, or two thirds of that, and then the splitting kind of process at a later date. Um, Alongside that, we have other videotape capture workflows. So we have an Ofcom workflow. Um, we have capturing um, one-inch videotape. I think one-inch is quite endangered, so we've been working through all of our one-inch collections at the BFI. Um, have I missed anything else, Lucy, on that? I think that's it. So yeah, there's, there's, this script is just an H22 script that I showed you, so that was just working on those 100,000, as far as I'm aware. But we have versions of that script that work on our 
our business, business as usual transcoding conversions. But now, of course, we've moved to Bluefish Capture that these transcoding scripts are generally being kind of put to bed now. Um, they're not so necessary for us. Any more? Peter? Thanks. Um, I was wondering, are you using the frame MD5 just for integrity checking of the conversion? And have you considered stream hash in comparison? No, we have not. Because no, in the past, we only had frame MD5 to do that. Mm. Um, but now there are alternatives. There's something where you get one hash code per stream, not um. per frame. Oh, I see what you mean, yes. So you get like an MD5 hash of the video stream entirely and then mm -hmm. an audio stream. Um, I actually just read a blog about that recently. I think it was um, Bay Area Video Coalition, Morgan O'Morrell. I saw that he was doing that with one of his conversions and it fl I flagged it in my mind, but I haven't come back to it yet. Because I was wondering if, if you run into errors, do you actually look at the frame of the fives and, and see how big the mm. impact is or do you just go like, it's not clean, just reset it? Um, we do have to evaluate them quite often, particularly now we're coming towards the end of the project. We have for like our exceptions workflows where we're getting a few little anomalies coming through in the captures. We do have to analyze them, yeah, um, and when we can work out what it is. For example, sometimes we have audio offset to the video and when we transcode that from V210 to FFV1, then the FFV1 gets extra video frames at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And so you have a mismatch there because there's like zero stream additional um, checksums in that frame MD5 that aren't in the V210, for example. And so, yes, when we, we do tend to just give them a, um, an overview and have a look at them and have a little discussion about what we think the problem is, and then we just try a couple of little homemade FFmpeg conversions to work out if we can fix it ourselves. And Yeah, there's not too many, thankfully, that yeah. we have to do that with because that's quite time-consuming work, obviously. Okay, but you do... Y mm. Enough, later. Thank you. <laughs> you sure? <laughs> later, let's definitely talk about that later. Yep. Uh, I was just curious about the um, uh, color tags you, sh you showed earlier in the different transcodes, uh, especially about the color trace one, which was set to BT709. Mm. Now, Depending on the capture cards, for instance, I've noticed that sometimes you get different values, like the one for gamma 2.8, for instance. So it's not always uh, consistent, especially if you're working with different vendors. So did you run into this situation? And if you change the value, did you have a way to log that, for instance? Since, uh... um, on a on a file by file basis, we're just at the moment we're looking um, for uh, we're, we're about to build a new kind of premise based. Uh, metadata tracking system so that we can try to track events that happen in the transcoding changeovers in our files so that we can map any differences or changes that we have happen to the files throughout the transcoding processes. We don't at the moment, but we do keep logs of, of the transcodes, etc. So we do kind of have a loose way of tracking that. With regard to the color trace, BT709, I think we hard code that into all our scripts. And I'm going to look at Dave now because I think that he may be recommended that to us. I'm not sure. That was a conversation my line manager had. So BT709 is our standard, I think, for any SD um, color trace information. Okay. I'd, I think I'd like to have a chat with you about that later, if that's okay. <laughs> uh, Joanna, I wanted to ask, like, I might have been out of the room when you were talking about this, but um, for all the sharing you're doing of the scripts and software that you're running, have you had much of a chance to share much of your recommendations for the hardware one might need if they're transcoding mm -hmm. mountains of DPX files or FFP1s? Because I imagine there was a lot of sort of expect experimentation and lessons learned in trying to pick out what computers, servers, and stuff you were doing. Um, that, again, um, a lot of that work was completed by my line manager, Stephen. McConaughey, um, he, I think, did a lot of research in that area. When it comes to DPX, um, I did create a cheat sheet last year for um, how to optimize your um, computer to do efficient DPX raw cooking. Um, so there was parallelization information in there and just talking about how CPUs, uh, more CPUs you've got basically, the more threads you can get and the faster encoding you can have. So there is some documentation that we've put out, but no, probably not as much as we could do. I should say that's something we could develop a bit more, David. Definitely. 
there's no more, shall I move on to this part two, which is the media asset management retrieval, uh, re replacement? Great, thank you ever so much. Those were great questions. <laughs>